Uh, my name is Francois Baldassari, and I'm here to tell you about how to de-risk product launch launches with device reliability engineering. This is a lofty title. In reality, there are no silver bullets. Um, you know, uh, uh, spoiler alerts. I'm only going to talk about techniques that I've used in the past, things we might do to, to remove some risk and, uh, and things I've seen work or, or, or not work in my career. Um, the, the, the other thing that I'll say in introduction is that this talk is going to be really focused on embedded software. Uh, we talk about hardware engineering, we talk about marketing, we talk about cloud development, all the pieces that go into making a product launch successful. However, my bias and my background is embedded software and therefore it's what I know best and that's the lens that I'm going to take here. Speaking of my bias, um, here's a quick note about who I am. My name is Francois Valdassari and I'm the founder and CEO here at Memfault. I founded Memfault with my co-founders, Chris uh, Coleman and Tyler Hoffman three years ago. But, but um, and, and Memfault is really the, the continuation of a lifelong obsession with automation, tooling, and efficiency. My career started in, in the firmware space. So I've been building embedded, um, embedded software for the past 10 years, including at companies like Oculus, where I led the embedded software team, Pebble, where I helped build the, the watch operating system, and some microsystems where I, I started my career with Chris back in Burlington, Massachusetts. I love talking about firmware. I, you know, I do these webinars on a regular, at a regular cadence. I also love writing about software, about firmware. And, and I think many of you already read our blog called Interrupts, but if you don't, you can find many of my musings on how we might build better embedded software and, and, and run better projects at interrupts.memfold.com. Last but not least, it's not on the slides, but my email address is Francois, which is my first name. No cedilla, F R A N C O I S, at memfold.com. Never hesitate to shoot me a note, especially if you want to talk about embedded software. I'm, I, I always have time for that. And I see a question that I can answer live. We will have uh, recordings of the webinar available. And I believe the slides as well, but Colleen, Colleen can uh, chime in. You might, you, might need to, uh, you might need to watch it again to get the slides. I'm not sure we'll be sharing the, the actual PDF, but Colleen will follow up. Yeah, we'll share the slides and the recording. Excellent. Um, I should have said you get the slide if you fill the survey. I guess that was a missed opportunity to encourage you. Um, do the survey at the end. We really, really enjoyed your, your feedback. It helps us make better content. So the agenda today, very simple. We're going to, we're going to go through three topics or two topics. We're going to talk about how we can ship on time. Once again, no silver bullets, but things we can do to make it more likely that we, that we ship on time. Specifically, I'm going to start by talking, by laying the grounds for what NPI typically looks like. NPI means new product introduction. So what a program, a hardware program typically looks like. So if you've heard this before, if you worked on a number of programs, you may find that these are things you already know, but they lay the ground for the rest of the conversation. And after that, I'm going to take some learnings based on what we know about the cycle. What are points of friction and how can we, how can we manage them better? How can we you know, handle the friction and the ambiguity and what techniques can we use to, to stay on schedule, especially as embedded software engineers, where we have many, many dependencies across the organization. And then the second piece I'm excited to talk about today is how to de-risk launches. Because as we know, shipping on time is only half of the battle. The, the other half is, is making sure that the thing we shipped is working properly, that our customers are happy with it, and that it's doing what it's meant to do. At the end, we'll have about 15 minutes for Q&A. Many of you submitted questions when you, um, when you signed up for this webinar, so we've got some amazing questions that I can't wait to answer. But I'll also be very excited to hear questions from you as you listen to this presentation. So don't hesitate to add them uh, into the, in the Zoom Q&A. Okay, let's talk about shipping on time. 
So I'll start with, this is, this is our traditional new product introduction timeline. If, if you've worked on a consumer electronics product, especially, many of these milestones will sound uh, very familiar. There are things you've, you've worked with before and, and you understand what they mean, but fear not if you haven't, we're going to go through them. Each of these gates are well-defined. They're used across the industry. I believe that Apple was one of the kind of main originator of, of some of the nomenclature that we're using here. But, but Apple people have spread through the industry and so we, we, we now find it everywhere. There's much that has been written out there about the NPI timeline. I especially like a blog post by Anna Shudletsky, who's the founder of Instrumental, where she goes through many, much, you know, each of those gates in many more details. And I recommend you go out and read that. So let's go through our NPI program, how we get from starting a program to launching a device. And, and talk about what we need to achieve at every, steps of, every step of the way. So first, at the very beginning, you know, we have a blank canvas. We have a product brief that tells us what we want to accomplish. And we're starting what we call the proto phase. The goal of the proto phase is to figure out what we want to build. Typically, there's a lot of 3D printing that takes place. We hack things together with dev boards. And we're trying to get what we call a works-like prototype, that is a a device that kind of does the things that the product is meant to do, as well as a looks like prototype, which is an inert device that the industrial, the industrial designers can use to show what the product will look like once it's complete. Importantly, those two are separate. So oftentimes as a firmware engineer, you're mostly focused on the works like prototype, which is an assemblage of dev boards, um, doesn't necessarily look too good, but, but starts to do the thing. I'll note that before we start on a program, a lot of work has happened upstream, right? We might have had to do some research to figure out what is actually possible. We might have had to invent new science if you're working on a cutting edge field. And the product team had to do market research and, and at least create a set of requirements for what we want to build. This proto phase, I think we, it, it never is long enough, is the reality. The experimentation phase is very fun. It's also a time of fast iteration. Most programs, most programs I've worked on have looked at that were kind of one year cadence of product updates have looked at a 12 week period for the proto phase. 12 week, 12 week goes by pretty quick, especially if you're sending things out uh, to get a board, a board uh, done or, or you know, to a, a prototyping lab to get a prototype built. You might have three or four iteration in a 12 week period, maybe a little faster if you've got some rapid prototyping capabilities internally. By the end of the proto phase, we have a good understanding of what we need to build, but everything is duct taped together. So we enter the real kind of uh, nuts and bolts engineering phase, what we call EVT, DVT, PVT. And I'm going to let you know what those mean. EVT is engineering validation tests. D is design, DVT is design validation test and PVT is production validation test. Each of those gates is going to be about testing some specific things about our device and maturing our program as we move along through it. So at EBT, what we want is a device that you know, is not cosmetically perfect, that probably doesn't get manufactured anywhere near any kind of yields. Many of our test stations are still in development. Many of our manufacturing stations are in development. But um, our tools are often soft tools rather than a half tool, uh, than, than, than hard tools. However, we have finalized you know, uh, uh, the engineering design and we have a handful of product configurations that we're considering. Perhaps we have a few different sensors that we're still trying to, to discriminate between. So we've made, we've built a few different configuration of our device with you know, accelerometer A, B and C. And we're putting them all through a manufacturing line at very low speed, still very ad hoc. So we get a good number of, of um, EBT devices that we can start testing more rigorously on. The EBT phase, um, at, by, by the EBT phase, there's no more works like and looks like prototype. There's the EBT device, which kind of looks like the final device and kind of works like the final device. Of course, much work is left to do. After EBT, we enter DVT. DVT is 
the design validation test phase. And at that point, what we're trying to show is that we can pass all manufacturing stations using final configuration that we have, we've, we've basically down selected the few things that we still had open are down selected. So we have a single configuration for our device or, or the few configuration we plan to go to market with, but we, we, we no longer have alternates that we're considering. And hopefully all the major bugs that are, are ironed out. Every program that work with has managed to keep a couple of bugs in the mix, but but the idea is that you know as much as possible the major ones are are, are ironed out. The um, the DVT phase goes through kind of a standard manufacturing flow, but of course we're not yet at yields, and there's a lot more work to do before we can we can ramp up. After DVT, we enter PVT production validation test. This is when we want to prove that we can actually manufacture at the rate that we need so that we can produce cosmetically perfect devices that work you know just like we want them to at the rate that we need to produce them in order to ramp oftentimes at pvt you know engineering pencils are down we're, we're really you know mechan the the mechanical engineering team the electrical engineering team they should have ironed out all the issues they were working on and they're really just there to help the operations and the production teams. Uh, by the time we're done with PVT, we have units that we that we that are oftentimes renewable. That means the PVT units may very well end up on shelves and be sold to customers. They, if, if everything goes well there, uh, just as uh, just as good as as production full on you know main ramp units. After PVT, we have to, oh, last thing I'll say, of course, is that each of those phases, EVT, DVT, PVT, um, how, how long might they take? What I say is eight weeks is a pretty aggressive schedule for each of those phases. I put six to eight weeks. Some programs I've worked on have managed to turn around each phase in, in, in less than eight weeks, as, as little as six weeks. But of course, remember, you're spending two weeks typically in China manufacturing, you're traveling back and forth. So then when you get back, if, it's, if you're on a six week cadence, you have four weeks to take in all the learnings, spin your designs and, and get prepared for the next phase, which is very, very quick. So, you know, a very, very tightly run program on an iterative product where you don't have major open questions that we're, you're still trying to figure out, uh, might be able to get it done in six to eight weeks, but that's, that's about as, as fast as it goes. And then of course we go into ramp. So ramp is something that, I, that people who aren't in the industry find counterintuitive. What do you mean? You know, I, my device is ready. It's cosmetically perfect. It manufactures at the right speeds. Why can't I just launch it? And it turns out that we, we just have to manufacture it. We have to manufacture enough of it for the launch. When we're building iPhones, you know, we might need millions and millions of them ready on shelves the day we announce them so that people can buy them. And that takes time. As a, as a point of reference, if you can make 50,000 devices per day, which is a pretty good cadence at a factory, if you can make 50,000 devices per day and you need 500,000 devices for your launch to supply all of your retail partners, you need to run for at least 10 days in order to hit that, 10, 10 you know, days of the factory running at full speed. Uh, oftentimes, it's actually much longer than that. So it, it might take two to four weeks or even longer um, to start ramp and then you know several weeks before you can actually launch your product and announce it. Yeah, four plus weeks. By the time by the time you, you know you ramp and you get the devices on boats and, and into your fulfillment centers and all that and, and they end up on shelves, it can be you know more than four weeks. But by then hopefully we're done. Everything's looking good. Customers start unboxing their devices and uh, we've had another successful launch. All in all, if you add all of these delays, you see that this NPI timeline, as I described it, takes about a year. Now, I think a year is about as aggressive as you can be. Some folks have nine months product development cycle that's very, very aggressive. And of course, the, the more aggressive you are, the less, the more iterative your process has to be from your previous product. Um, I think more typical is a two year cycle where you might actually have overlapping product cycles where you're releasing a product every year, but, but you start, you know, you take two years to release it. So you have two programs happening in parallel. Um, but, but I've worked on several one year long NPI programs and while, you know, very 
challenging, rushed, and 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 you know surprisingly quick, um, it is possible, and and I think it's a good a good number to have in mind. So before I keep moving, I'd love to hear from you. You know, time to wake up. The 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 part about all the stuff we already know is hopefully over, but I'd love to hear what your NPI program looks like. I'm going to start a poll. Um, you should be able to see it now. There we go. I'd love to hear how long your NPI program pro programs take. Do you take two years, more than two years, 12 months or less? Uh, what, what, what does NPI look like for you? And we already got a, a bunch of responses coming in. Great. I'll give us 10 more seconds before we move, we keep moving. Okay, so as we see, we have a pretty even split. Most folks work on programs that are uh, less than two years, especially if you add option A, B, and C, but we do have a few folks here, eight people who work on programs that take longer than two years. Of course, if you're working on something like a car, right, so, or, or you know, safety critical devices, medical devices, the programs could take a lot longer than that. Um, we've got a few folks add to our less than 12 months, eight people also. Um, I'll be curious to hear what kind of devices those are, because that's always, that's a pretty sustained pace. Um, let's keep moving. Okay, so we talked about the NPI program, but what about firmware? The thing that, that you know, I, I think about the most. The firmware team, of course, isn't too focused on how many manufacturing test station pass or what whether you know we have the or whether the device is cosmetically perfect but we have our own set of things that we need to make sure we have done in time to support that timeline so i've highlighted five five milestones that i think firmware teams need to keep in mind as they think about the product development cycle first milestone is bring up complete that means we've had we have to have you know bring the little bit of driver code that we need to bring up every subsystem on the device so that a works like prototype can be can be exercised a little bit can be instrumented uh, we oftentimes have some, some prototype code that's you know necessarily production worthy but that we've built alongside our bring up codes in order to um, maybe show something on the screen or you know play an audio file or something like that bring up is necessary to enable other teams who have proto you know proto milestone based activities your electrical engineers are going to need to test several several of the sensors and make sure that they're to spec um, and they'll need your firmware code your bring up code to do that so our first milestone is making sure that we can we can complete all bring up activities well ahead of the proto milestone typically we need we need this done two to three weeks you know four weeks let's say after after we've started the program um, between proto and ebt we need to, ahead of EBT, make sure that we've got the hardware test firmware complete. That means we need to have a firmware that can be used at EBT to validate every single subsystem of the device. So, so the, the, the device doesn't have to have an end-to-end -end experience that works, but every sensor, you know, every your, your flash file system needs to be working properly, your, your screen needs to be working properly, and, and all of those things have to be integrated into a single firmware that can be used to, to fully test the hardware. That needs to be well ahead of EBT because we manufacture with that firmware and then we, we test things at EBT with that hardware test firmware. Between EBT and DBT, we look for what we call manufacturing firmware being complete. Because remember, at DBT, manufacturing is no longer, a, you know, it's a full dress rehearsal. It's no longer ad hoc. So at DBT, we want every test station to be final, we want hard tools, and we, of course, want the test firmware that we'll use at, for manufacturing. Otherwise, it's not a full dress rehearsal. So manufacturing firmware needs to be complete. Doesn't mean that, you know, we, I'll now talk about decoupling manufacturing from application firmware. It doesn't mean we're completely done with everything else, but at least, you know, factory tests and things like that. Last but not least, you know, before PVT, we want to launch firmware complete. Because remember, our PVT units might end up on customer shelves. So they're just as good as production units. They need the production firmware. So that needs to be complete before PVT. And last but not least, before launch, we have what I call the day zero firmware. 
I have a special slide about day zero firmware that I'm going to cover a little bit down the line, but it's in effect our final firmware, our final user firmware. And it gives us the opportunity to get a couple additional weeks of development rather than have to have, to have everything done uh, by that PVT milestone. After firmware, we might think about marketing, which has its own set of constraints and dependencies. We might think about factory automation and they might, that might have their own set of constraints and, of, and dependencies. There may be cloud software that we're building to support different parts of the device and the launch. Increasingly, that's a key part of building an IoT device. And all of that creates what I call a dependency spiral. And what makes these programs risky is the number of dependencies, how complex they are, and the likelihood that you might miss something and end up blocking another team and delaying the schedule. This is why when I talk about shipping on time, I think we need to come up with techniques that allow us to decouple the different parts of the work we need to do so that we can manage those dependencies you know, on their own timeline and not worry too much that something that's a little bit late might impact everything else downstream. And because I'm a firmware engineer, I think about how can I decouple my embedded software from the hardware timeline? How can I make sure I have all of my work ready I have as much time as possible for development and don't depend as much on other teams. And I'm going to go over four techniques that I've used to decouple those timelines and make programs more successful. Number one, test-driven development, which is the idea, the, 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 the idea that you, you develop against tests. Number two is day zero updates, sending an update before customer unboxes the device. Number three, using a hardware abstraction layer, also called a HAL. And number four, splitting our manufacturing firmware from our application firmware. I'm gonna go over each of these and give you more details. So first, test-driven development. What is test-driven de test development or TDD? I'm sure many of you have heard about it. It's the idea that instead of building our firmware against our real hardware, we build our firmware against a software test harness which might be a set of unit tests, like using something like Google tests or CPPU tests, or using a simulator like Renodes or, or uh, Kimu. The advantage of doing test-driven development is that you no longer need the hardware to be ready in order to, to do a lot of your development. You can in effect get a, get a jump on the proto phase by starting firmware development against your, your own you know, test software. You can iterate much faster because it is a lot faster to run a quick unit test and debug it on your host than it is to flash the device, you know, push the buttons, run the test manually. And then last but not least, it has the advantage that it leaves you with a set of tests. So once you've done test-driven development, you have all these tests that you can use to verify that future changes you make to your firmware don't introduce regression. Of course, you won't fix every problem with tests, but you will catch some of them. We've written at length about test-driven developments, and you can see I have links to two blog posts on interrupts that we've written about using emulators to do TDD and using unit tests, things like CPPU tests and other test frameworks um, to do test-driven development. The second thing that we do is we do a day zero update. As I mentioned earlier, a day zero update is a software update that you apply at the time of unboxing the device. So instead of flashing your final firmware in factory and the, the customer opens the, the box and takes it out and starts using the device, instead of doing that, when the user opens the box, they actually have to go through a software update to, to update to the day zero update um, and, and get the very latest firmware before they can use the device. Of course, there's a downside, which is that the, the user won't get to immediately use the device. They don't need to wait for an update. But, as, but, but for better or for worse, this is going to be the experience of your users anyway, because you may not do a day zero update, but six months later, you'll have a new firmware update. And you're not going to, every time you push a firmware update, update the firmware in factory. So your users are going to have an update and unboxing soon enough. If not at day zero, six months in, your new customers will, will have that experience. So I think not, not that much is lost in that context. 
And the benefits are huge. If you decouple the dependency between your PVT build and your golden master software, that is the final firmware for your customers, you can actually extend your schedule by four weeks. And I, I did a little diagram or, or many more weeks. I did a little diagram that shows you that additional development time. So in the, in the past, we might have done our final firmware at PVT. So we tightly coupled a manufacturing deadline with a firmware deadline. And by doing a day zero update, we're gaining 60, here we're gaining actually uh, six to eight weeks of development time to, to, to build new features, polish our firmware, fix a couple bugs. Um, and, and on some of these fast programs, every week helps. We talked about a hardware abstraction layer. Um, I think many of you nowadays use abstraction layers either provided by your real-time operating systems or you're using a, a vendor-specific HAL like, like uh, ST, the STM32 cube that ST provides. The best, of course, is using something that's truly cross-platform so that you can easily port your hardware to new, to your, your firmware to new hardware. I'm a big fan of a project called Zephyr, which is a real-time operating system um, managed by the, maintained by the Linux Foundation, which comes with a really strong HAL and good buy-in from silicon manufacturers. What the HAL gives you is, so it decouples the firmware from the underlying hardware. Again, talking about decoupling pieces of your program, it creates, it gives you the ability to, um, you know, react as your electrical engineers make changes to the program. They might change the microcontroller between Proto and EVT. If you have a good HAL, you can easily make, you know, help them with that change. And if, if you don't have a good HAL, it's going to be a lot of work for you. It also creates optionality um, in, in your supply chain. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard about supply chain constraints. You might even have been asked to quickly port your firmware to completely new hardware, as if that was nothing. <laughs> and we all know that that can be really, really hard. But if we have a good how, we can make our life easier. It won't solve every problem for us, but it will, it will certainly make it easier. And then last but not least, a how allows you to reuse your code from project to project. Here again, creating efficiency, not just within a program, but across programs. As our code becomes more and more complicated, because these MCUs have more and more RAM and more and more CPU, we're building more and more software, code reuse becomes really important because rebuilding everything from scratch becomes a monstrous task. And having a strong HAL makes code reuse easier. And then last but not least, I often talk about splitting your manufacturing firmware and your application firmware. I've actually gone back and forth on this one, and I'll, I'll talk more about this. But what, what this means is having a purpose-built firmware that you use on the manufacturing line, um, which, is, which really is used only for the manufacturing tests and other kind of manufacturing activities. And at the end of your manufacturing line, once you've gone through all the test station, you load your application firmware, which is different. One of you actually asked about this as a um, as a, a question when you signed up for this webinar. So I'm I'm glad to be able to address it. What does this give you? What what it what it gives you is you, you're you're insu ins insulating your manufacturing firmware from the churn of your application firmware because you want your manufacturing firmware to be really stable and not you know not have to change a lot. You're not going to update it on the line too many times. And so you're much better off having an application firmware that you keep working on, you know, iterating quickly, um, even after DBT into your day zero updates, um, then, then uh, expose your manufacturing firmware to this kind of churn. It also saves code space because you can strip out all the manufacturing functions from your application firmware. And, and because the manufacturing firmware and application firmware are never loaded together at the same time, you know, you've got more code space to do each. But I will, I will share one caveat, which is that um, you have to watch out for dependencies between your application and your manufacturing firmware. For example, sensor configuration. I worked on a program once where we had an accelerometer and at some point in the application firmware, we changed the configuration of the accelerometer to go from, I think it was 8G, range to 16G range. And when we did that, we didn't immediately change the manufacturing firmware. And so for a while, all of our 
calibration and manufacturing tests were completely useless because they weren't calibrated against the production configuration, the, application, the app configuration. So if you do split these two, which has tangible benefits, make sure you have a way to manage the dependencies between the two. And, and you, you can know to update the manufacturing firmware when needed. OK, so we talked about how do we, how do we manage the timeline of a program? How do we decouple you know, firmware engineering from, from other parts of our program? And hopefully, we've managed to, to get a program going, ship everything on time, and, and, uh, and launch our products. And, and that, that's an amazing moment, I think, every year or every two years when your product launches. It feels like a big party. And for just 48 hours, we're on top of the world. And then, and then the reality sets in that uh, the work is, is, is certainly not done, right? Once we've launched and customers actually start using the product, they always come up with ways to use it, or they have wonky Wi-Fi networks or, you know, bad RF environments. And all of a sudden things stop working properly and we start getting bug reports. We start having customers who need RMAs, their devices aren't working at all. Um, there's, there's security issues that come up. The product team reminds us that we didn't ship one of the features and we, we need to push an update to improve it. Customers complain about things on Amazon. There's always all kinds of things that happen pretty quickly. And so in fact, the work isn't done and, and we've done everything we can to have a successful launch, but now we need a successful product that, that delivers long-term value to our customers. And you might say, oh, my device is simple or, or you know, we have really good QA. This isn't going to happen to me. And I, I respectfully disagree. Um, I, I think that this will happen to you. And in fact, it happens to everyone. Jack Genzel, who you know, I think many of you read his newsletter, says that for, you know, for every thousand lines of code, we have between 10 and 100 defects. That's, that's a lot of defects. You're not going to find all of them because some of these issues are very intermittent. So they might happen only once every 10,000 hours of runtime. And so how many, how many 10,000 hour cycles is your, your QA team really going to put your device through? And then how many edge cases are we going, how many edge cases are going to be exercised that much? Some of these issues you can safely ignore, but some of them, of course, will be severe enough that you have to do something about them. Some, some of them will even be security bugs. They will allow people to take over your device remotely, use them in a botnet or, or other kinds of terrible things. And, and, and I really believe that it's the law of large numbers. Once you produce thousands, tens of thousands of devices, you will necessarily encounter problems that you just did not see with 100 devices in QA. I have this quote on the right that I often use, which is about the, the um, Mars Curiosity rover. NASA has actually updated it, I think, 11 times by now. So if even NASA needs an over-the-year update to fix bugs in their rover, I think that we're most, most likely we, we just have to resign ourselves to the fact that we're going to uh, we're gonna need to do that as well. So if we accept the fact that there's going to be problems, how do we de-risk those, those problems? How do we address those problems when we ship the product? And, and I like to talk about device reliability engineering, which to me is the practice of you know, managing devices after they ship to, to maintain a high degree of reliability. And, and I articulated around three main pillars, over the year updates, which is required to fix issues, you know, you can't fix an issue just, just by writing new code. You have to actually be able to push the code to the device so that they stop seeing the problem. Performance monitoring, so you can be alerted when the device does things you don't think it should be doing. And remote debugging, so that you can get the logs you need and you can, um, and you can get you know, other types of artifacts you need to fix the problems. One of you, one of you actually asked me, um, about reproducing issues, right? That, that it can be a huge time sink to reproduce a problem and sometimes we, we can't reproduce them. And this is where remote debugging comes in. It, I, in an ideal case, you can actually capture the data you need when the problem occurs in your customer's hands rather than try to reproduce it in, in your own hands. Because again, if it takes 10,000 hours of runtime and 
it's going to take you a while to reproduce that problem. So I'm going to, over, going to go over each of those. First is robust OTA. OTA is your insurance policy against problems. If you can't update your device, you can't fix problems. So you need your OTA to be very, very robust. At Pebble, we tested every night our OTA uh, software by running 100 software updates to the watch from our iOS, from an iOS device, 100 software updates to the watch from an Android device. And we also did that for every software release because we knew that we could break anything else as long as we had OTA, we'd be okay. And an OT, a good OTA system needs a few uh, specific features like cohorts, stage rollouts, and what we call must pass through releases. Starting with cohorts. Cohorts are the ability to group devices and update each group of devices separately. So you might decide to have some, you know, it, it makes sense that you can't update every device you've ever made at the same time, because you're going to have some beta users, you're going to have to have some internal employee users that might be on a different version. And of course, you'll have some, uh, you know, your, most of your production users will be on a third version that maybe is a little bit behind the other two cohorts. By, by having a tool that lets you update devices by cohorts, you can do A-B tests, you can, you can do beta tests, and, and you can basically experiment and make sure things are working right before you push updates to the rest of the fleet. Stage rollouts are the same idea, but instead of splitting your fleet in cohorts, you might want to do updates to a percentage of your fleets over time. So I like to do stage rollouts starting with 10% of my fleets, so that if a problem occurs, I limit the blast radius. I only have a small percentage of my devices that are running my new firmware that might have a new bug, and I can pause the rollouts, fix the issue before I push updates to, to many more devices. So by adding stage rollouts, which is the ability to push to a small percentage of your fleet at a time, you uh, further you know, have optionality in, in ways you can test your firmware before you push it to everyone. And then must pass through releases. This one is, you know, until you need it, you don't really think about it. Um, when, you, when you do, eventually you'll do a firmware update that is incompatible with a previous version. And so you'll have a migration. Maybe you have a file on your file system that you need to resize, or you need to change the format of that file. And so you're going to need to basically cadence, you know, run your devices through a, a set of updates. You might have you know, a version 1.2, and then that has to update to 2.0 before it can update to 3.0, right? You have to run a device through multiple updates at a time. And so your OTA system needs to be able to, to actually orchestrate that. Okay, so that's OTA updates. Performance metrics are the second tool in our tool belt to do device reliability engineering. Performance metric is about figuring out how are my devices doing? Is the connectivity working right? Am I using too much memory? Is, is the device you know, running at a higher temperature than I thought? This, you know, the only way to know those things is to measure them. But to measure them, especially on a microcontroller-based device, is, is difficult. You need to build a system that has very low overhead, doesn't impact, you know, doesn't consume too much battery, too much CPU, too much memory. It has to be easy to extend because you're going to constantly add new features and therefore have more metrics you need to, to add. And of course, it needs to be privacy preserving because today, you know, we're putting devices in people's homes and they're very, very sensitive to the idea of, of you spying on them through their, these devices. So you need to build a system that really takes into account privacy and, and doesn't allow abuse. Um, we at Memfold, we think of metrics in two specific ways. We looked at individual devices, device metrics. So collecting data from, from each individual device. So you can then look up the device and look at its data. So if a customer, for example, comes in and says, hey, my device has low battery life. It dies after two days, but it said on the box that it has five days of battery life. What gives? You should be able to use your individual device metrics to uh, pull up a, a given device and look at its battery statistics and look at what else is going on on the device. Um, was it was the CPU active a lot or was it sending a lot of data over wireless? Whatever it is, having device data on a device per device basis allows you to answer those questions. And of course, once you have data on an individual device basis, you, you really are going to want to know how does this look at the fleet level? 
So you need to be able to aggregate those devices. What's my average battery life in the field? You know, or how, or how much free memory on average, or what's the, the max amount of free memory that any device in my fleet sees? Dashboards allow you to understand how the overall fleet is working and quickly identify trends. So you want a system that has both those things, as well as alerts. Alerts are basically the, the, a small system that takes the metrics that you collect and um, lets you set thresholds so that you might be alerted if those thresholds are hit. For example, if your devices have their CPU running more than 90% of the time across your fleets on average, you might want to know about this. You can create an alert that says high CPU usage and get an email or a Slack message or whatever other system you use when that happens. Last but not least, remote debugging. Why do we need remote debugging? Well, I've in, to illustrate this, I've kind of drawn a typical support flow for a customer when, when something happens that they're unhappy with. So on the left, you see all your customer reports and your customers might call in and say, you know, things like the Bluetooth keeps disconnecting or the audio drops randomly or the battery life isn't what I expected. And they get in touch with your support team. And your support team will ask them to turn the device off and back on. And eventually they might issue an RMA or they might, they might ask a customer to manually collect some logs and then they'll forward all of this to the engineering team. As an engineer, you might get a device that was just returned with very little context, or you might have a bunch of logs that were emailed to you, no automated analysis, no correlation between device. So this can be um, a very difficult process because the next thing you'll have to do is reproduce the problem yourself. All in all, before you even find out about the problem, it takes two weeks, and then it might take you weeks to reproduce it also. With remote debugging, and I think this is really key, you, you can actually shrink that timeline down to just minutes. If you have an automated reports from the devices that tell you, hey, here's a problem I'm experiencing, you feed that through some cloud system that can then analyze all the issues and deduplicate them so that instead of hearing individual issues from individual customers, you find out that there are 10 customers who all experience the same Bluetooth issue then and, and have that plugged into an automated system that will alert your engineering team. You can skip this whole you know, song and dance about you know, support, RMA, and eventually escalation to engineering. So you get a mean time to detection that goes from weeks to minutes. And of course, you, you can also collect the data you need to fix the problems. You don't need to reproduce it. At Memfault, we like to talk about core dumps, which are, you know, I think they're, they're not a new idea. You've, you've probably seen core dumps in other contexts. But in effect, a core dump is, is a payload that contacts that, connect, ah, that contains context and diagnostics data around an issue and gives you the backtrace, the logs, the register value, the memory, all the data that you, that you would need to fix the problem without having to, um, without having to reproduce it yourself or get the customer to manually upload those things to you. So those are the, the four, well, the three tools that I look at for um, for device reliability engineering and to make sure that our launches, you know, not only the device launches on time, but it's a successful product introduction. Um, OTA, performance metrics, and remote debugging. I'd love to hear which of those you already do. So I'm, I have a second poll that I'm about to publish. There we go. It's a multiple choice, so you can actually select multiple of them. Um, I, you know, I expect that many, many of you do OTA. I'll be very curious to hear how many do remote debugging today. Um, and and I, I know that a few a few will have none of those things. For me, I will say building a product without OTA stresses me out. <laughs> but I know it's not always possible. And here again, we'll add uh, 10 more seconds. OK. So as expected, we see that 77% of responders here have OTA. Um, and a good number of you, almost half, use performance metrics. Remote debugging, which for me is, is you know, a big life changer, 
is still, um, and, and we see this when we talk to, to companies out there, still something that we don't do a lot of. I'll be curious to hear for those of you who do have a remote debugging setup, how's that working for you? What are the things that you love? What are the things you wished you had? Um, and, and of course, there are people who work on products where perhaps it's not practical to have an OTA update, or perhaps there's really strict security requirements that make it uh, impossible to, to even implement. Or maybe the devices aren't connected to the internet in the first place. Um, thank you for sharing. Last thing I'll say before we'll go into questions, and, and remember that you can, you can write some questions um, in the Q&A using the Q&A tab in Zoom. You know, at Menfold, we've built a device for, uh, uh, we've built a uh, cloud application, sorry, for IoT reliability. We've built what we'd like to call the first IoT reliability platforms. Many of the things that I've talked about here, including, um, you know, OTA with cohorts and stage rollouts, metrics, remote debugging are all included in the Menfold platform. Um, but of course, there are other ways to do this, I think. You know, rather than build it yourself, though, it's really great to be able to have something off the shelf. And with that, that's the end of the presentation part of this webinar. I would love to answer your questions and uh, and talk some more with all of you. All right. Thanks, Francois. I'll go through some questions from our audience. Um, the first one is multi-part. What are the best ways to plan and execute a release? Having zero bugs for releases seems to be the solution, but not too feasible. How do teams classify between bugs that need immediate attention and the ones that are left for a later release? Yeah, prioritization, you know, there is no silver bullet for prioritization, right? It's like different companies will have different um, tolerance for risk or, or quality requirements. But I will say there's a couple of things that of course are important to look at. The first one is how many people are impacted by this, by this issue. If you've caught an issue and you know for a fact that only 0.1% of your customers are experiencing it, it's probably low priority. If you see an issue that you know that 50% of your customers are experiencing, I mean, it's a hair on, hair on fire moment and uh, you, should, you should likely do something about it right away. The, the other thing, of course, is the, the potential for impacts uh, on the device itself. Some bugs might break your device. They might render them, render them completely inoperable, and you should prioritize those. So between how severe is the injury and how many people are impacted, you have a pretty good prioritization framework. Great, thank you. The next question is, how do you categorize errors and how do you handle them when occurring in the field? Kind of to add on that a little bit more. How do you categorize issues? Well, I think, you know, there's the, there's the prioritization bits that we just talked about. The, um, sorry, the, um, uh, the severity part that we just talked about. And then the other way you categorize issues is, you know, by type of problem. You might have some connectivity issues. You might have some a hard fault. You might have a stack overflow. You might have a you know power on risk, like a device that runs out of power. All of these can be either automatically detected or manually annotated afterwards. Um, so, so I think that that's one way we might categorize. I see also some folks that are writing in some additional questions. So Akenshu just asked during A-B test, what is the ideal number to choose of respondents to choose? Um, you know, I, I, typically you, you, you need basically a statistically significant number of devices for your A-B test. So if your A-B test is testing a behavior that your customers do all the time, then you can choose a small number of customers and that will be statistically significant. You'll get enough samples. But if you're testing something that your customers do very rarely, you'll need a bigger sample. Typically, when I run an A-B test, I like to, I, you know, for a mid-sized fleet, right? Let's say you have 100,000 devices. I like to choose at least 5% of devices to include them in my A-B test. So, so you know, 5% on configuration B and 5% on configuration A at the very least. Um, so that would be, you know, in this case, 5,000 devices each. Uh, and Alexandru, I will um, 
type and so life. Alexandru asks, when, t when using TDD, how do you minimize the risk that a firmware which passes all the tests fails in production? Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, yeah, we can hear you now. I, I'm not sure what happened, but anyways, we're back. So I, I I forget, I don't know when you lost me, but long story short, hardware in the loop tests can be automated. They, you know, they're very costly, they run very slowly. So you can't use them to test everything, but they should be augmenting your pure software tests. And um, and you need manual QA. You can't do away with it altogether. But I think of these techniques are as layering on top of each other, decoupling pieces of your program and, and de-risking you know, uh, issues one bit at a time. Sarat asks, how many devices should the OTA test be done, be done before quali qualifying the device for OTA capability? I think Sarat, the reality is you need to qualify it on as many devices as you can and you're going to be limited by manufacturing. So your OTA is likely going to be something that you need to complete during the EVT timeframe. And so however many EVT devices you have, hopefully about 100 at the very least, is what you're going to need to, to validate your OTA. I like to say that you need to be able to update a device 100 times in every configuration that you have in the field um, in order to, to feel good about your OTA. I also like to say that you should use your performance metric system to collect data about your OTA so that if there's a problem with it, you can be alerted very, very quickly. Back to you, Colleen. Yeah, we have a few more questions that were submitted. The next one is, how does Memfault help in faster firmware development cycle? What firmware issues can it detect? Um, so we talked a little bit about Memfault, which is the platform we've built uh, in order to, to, to provide device reliability engineering. And, and you know, of course, one of the big things we've invested in is um, issue detection and automatic, you know, automatic uh, classification of these issues. And, and long story short, we can automatically detect a wide range of issues, including all kinds of uh, you know, resets, like hard faults, stack overflows, you know, out of memory errors, you know, uninitialized variable errors, um, um, you know, devices run out of power. We also give you tools to annotate and create your own types of errors so that you can have application level errors also logged in our tool. Great. Um, the next question is, how can you quantify reliability and maximize uptime? So how do you quantify reliability? That's a great question. Um, for me, ultimately, the, the best generic measure for reliability is, is a time, mean time between failures. So, so in other words, on average, how long does it take for a device to go from one error to another error? And you want that number to be as big as possible, right? Like hopefully, the mean time between failure is infinite and your device never fails. But in all likelihood, it's going to be, it's going to be uh, a little bit lower than that. So, so I think that depending on your device, on a consumer, consumer electronics device, you know, a mean time between an error of, of a month is pretty good. Uh, if you're looking at medical devices or safety critical software, probably want a mean time between failure in the 10 year range. Um, and, and so, you know, uh, it, but but I think that that's the most the best kind of not application specific measure for for reliability and quality. There are many other that are more subjective, 
right? Um, you know, customer NPS, net promoter score from your customer, how happy they are about how much they promote your products um, or even, um, you know, things that are specific to how your product itself functions. Another question that was submitted, more of a fun one. What was the most difficult complex bug you saw in production? And how did you go about root causing and fixing it? How was the most complex bug that I found in production? Um, you know, there's a story that comes to mind, which actually was one of the scariest bug of my career. It was an OTA bug. We had a device which we we it was uh, we had a device which had an OTA capability over Bluetooth, and one day we shipped a new version, and we found out that customers who had Android phones were not able to OTA their way out of that version. In other words, that version we had broken OTA somehow. So as you can imagine, we were we were really stressed out. We immediately paused all further updates and we started debugging, and what we found out is that our OTA code was relying on an uninitialized variable, classic C bug, right? And that uninitialized variable happened to be set to zero in the previous version of the firmware because it was quite early in the, in the uh, start sequence when the, when the firmware was initializing. And then some re refactor of codes changed the order in which things were being initialized and now that uninitialized variable had different data in it. It was now set to basically a one. And when it was set to one, firmware update wouldn't take place. And so that was really problematic because you know, without OTA, how do you fix the bug? And it turns out that my co-founder, Chris Coleman, who was a fantastic engineer, um, and I was working with him at the time, figured out the exact right sequence of Bluetooth messages to send to the device to nudge the right bits of memory into that uninitialized memory region so that it would be again zero and a firmware update could take place. And so we shipped an update to our mobile app and the mobile app would do this Konami codes, you know, this sequence of Bluetooth messages, which would set the memory to just the right values and then do the firmware update. And I cannot believe that he figured that out. I cannot believe that it worked, but it was one great story. I think we might have time for one more colleague. Yeah, I think one more to end it. Um, what might be the impact of collecting the diagnostic data on devices battery life and device performance? How could we minimize the impact on the device performance due to diagnostic support? Yeah, this is, you know, uh, uh, once again, all these questions are very good because they have subtle, difficult, nuanced answers. Um, there is no you know, perfect rule you can follow. Some devices will be so sensitive to overheads that, that they might not be able to collect much data. But I think the key is to build a performance monitoring system that is very, very low overhead. In other words, that, that uses you know, very little RAM, that runs very rarely, and, that's, um, and that sends very little data. One key insight is that you can actually lower your duty cycle a lot or, or increase your duty cycle a, uh, a lot. So in other words, you can collect data very rarely, but from a very large number of devices, and it will actually give you a pretty good density of data. So for example, we typically recommend customers collect performance monitoring data only once per hour. So that's, a, that's very slow and it ends up, you know, in, on, on an average device, a lot happens in an hour. And so if you just collect a little bit of diagnostics data once per hour, the impact on the device's battery life and, and throughput and performance is, is basically zero. But you're, but you're trading off, you know, fidelity of your diagnostics data for, for, for you know, impact on the device itself. If you have enough, enough devices collecting a data point per hour, you end up with really good uh, data from the fleet overall. So that's you know, one way that we can, we can manage that. Ultimately, we find that for you know, the techniques that we've developed for most of our customers are well within the noise floor of their device's uh, performance in terms of battery level. 
but but every once in a while you can you will run into a, a business that has such tight battery margins that they can't collect much at all and so the key is having sdks and systems that can be scaled up and down as needed and then i see one question from surat on um uh, which is what's the difference between production firmware and golden firmware? Basically, you know, golden master is typically the, the final firmware for the customers when you launch your products. Uh, production firmware is a little bit of a looser term. Oftentimes, I mean, I, I call production firmware the firmware that goes at PVT is the firmware that's loaded at the end of the factory line. It's different from the golden master, which ends up being your day zero updates. But, you know, Every company uses these terms slightly differently. And with that, we're at the end of the hour. Thank you so much for submitting so many wonderful questions. Uh, 